If you've spent any amount of time on the internet lately, or in the past 10 years, you've come in contact with a meme. They look like this. I mean, generally. They sometimes also look like this. But what exactly are they? How do you use them? What does misuse look like? What does it look like when good memes go bad? I'll be going over all these questions and diving into a bit into problematic uses of memes that take the form of digital blackface. So, for those of you who are unfamiliar, let's break them down, shall we? A meme is constructed of an image macro and text, and no one is safe. Memes are made from all kinds of media, TV, film, news coverage, old family photos, everything. If it exists in some form on the internet, someone may make a meme out of it. Someone probably will make a meme out of it. The image macro can be remixed, but the basic elements remain the same. As Davidson explains, one person acts and another person copies that person exactly. Other times, the process of replication is less exact. He elaborates that the meme consists of three components, the manifestation, or the image macro, the behavior, uh, the action in the meme itself, and the ideal, the idea conveyed by the meme. For Davidson, as long as one of those three components is passed on, the meme is replicating, even if mutating and adapting. So looking at the distracted boyfriend meme, uh, you have the basic meme, the behavior of the meme continued through the socialism distracted boyfriend, and the ideal of it continued into the baby Yoda distracted boyfriend. There was no way I could do something about memes and not have baby Yoda involved. But here's where we get really nerdy with it. Memes capture moments in life that you could describe verbally but would just take too long. They're a cultural shorthand that reflects very human moments that don't need to rely on the consumer-producer binary. Uh, Wiggins and Bowers, by the way, check them out. And that's why I love them. It usually doesn't matter who created the iteration you're looking at. You can freely participate in making your own, just like you can freely participate in writing your own blog. They're a method of visual communication. Wiggins and Bauer suggest that memes exist in a state of virtual physicality. Essentially, they use the term virtual physicality to suggest that in order to interpret a meme, you need to have an understanding of the digital environment in which they exist, like the community in which they were posted, examples being uh, Reddit communities like our prequel memes or our meme economy, as well as the ability to connect the references embedded within the memes. This is largely because the internet memes exist as artifacts of participatory digital culture, where they are consistently and constantly reworked and reinvented to speak to different audiences. They are inherently tied to the ability to widely share, edit, write, and rewrite all the elements of digital life that have democratized the process of creation. So memes, we understand them now in theory. But how are they used and misused in real life? I'll be framing the next bit looking at two memes in particular, Success Kid and Kimberly Wilkins, AKA Sweet Brown. I'll be examining how these memes are generally used and what it looks like and the repercussions when they're abused. Usage can range from the innocent and mundane to the political to the racist, unsurprisingly. So, Success Kid. According to KnowYourMeme.com, the original image was taken by photographer Lainey Greiner of her then 11-month-old son, 11-month-old son, not year-old, Sammy, on August 26, 2007. She posted it to both her personal Flickr account and put it up on Getty Images. This has since been removed. Uh, success Kid is often used to celebrate tiny, often mundane moments of success, like being late to class, but the teacher is later, so you escape punishment. That's a success. A recent misuse of this meme came up when the U.S. Representative Steve King used the success meme, Success Kid meme, as part of his political advertising campaign on Facebook, highlighting a very new, a very disturbing new trend of right-wing politicians using internet memes to appear more relatable in their campaigns. Check out the articles from Digital Trend on Michael Bloomberg's use of memes for his political campaign for more on this in the description, or a Mother Jones piece on training sessions being held for right-wing political supporters. I, I just cannot get into that right now. I would talk about nothing else. Um, so attorneys representing Lainey Greiner sent a, a cease and desist letter to King and his re-election campaign. This case is particularly interesting because on the surface, the basic use of the meme was, well, clumsy, overall, fine. Uh, the ideal of the meme was there, I guess. King's use was more about trying to rally people to his cause rather than celebrating a success, but it would be overlookable. Uh, the success kid meme had been used in other forms of advertising, 
without the same request to take it down. The thing that prompted the cease and desist letter was who was using the meme and that this person was actively profiting off of it. As outlined in Brennan's article, Lainey Greiner posted a Twitter thread explaining her perspective on Representative King using her images to help fund his re-election campaign and how she and her family were not supporters of his and would not tolerate him po profiting off its use. The campaign removed the image and posted an apology. Sweet Brown is another super popular meme. Uh, according to knowyourmeme.com, the Sweet Brown meme image macro came from news footage taken by K4 News Channel 4 on April 7, 2012. A fire had broken out at an apartment building in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and the news team interviewed resident Kimberly Wilkins, aka Sweet Brown. When describing her escape from the building, Miss Wilkins said that the now famous line of ain't nobody got time for that when she was saying she didn't have time to put on her shoes before fleeing the burning building. The Sweet Brown meme has been used as a still image, a gif, the video clip has been remi remixed and put to a beat. It's been used in a wide spectrum of instances, from communicating that you're too busy to sleep to that you don't have time for cancer to take over your life. Its use has also dipped into unsurprisingly racist statements as well. Thinking about the Sweet Brown meme, on April 12th, NBC conducted a follow-up interview of both Sweet Brown and her son, who were apparently shocked by the amount of YouTube views on her original news report had received. Uh, this is according to knowyourmeme.com. For me, this was a nice reminder that there are real people represented in these pieces of viral media that millions of people use and remix for all kinds of purposes, largely without the consent or even knowledge of the person being represented. So Ms. Wilkins filed a federal copyright infringement lawsuit and a compensation of $15 million against Apple Inc. Seattle-based Seattle radio program, The Bob Rivers Show, and a number of other parties for unauthorized use of her likeness for commercial purposes. Again, we see the repercussions of what happens in the digital sphere play out in the physical world. A company used another person's likeness for their own profit, and Miss Wilkins rightfully claimed ownership over that. Cases like these highlight the lines between creative free expression and sharing versus capitalist opportunism. Something we should consider as we use these images is if the use is empowering people or contributing to harmful or racist stereotypes. We should also consider whether we are engaging in a form of digital blackface, a sentiment echoed by authors such as W. Aaron and A. Phillips. So when good memes go bad, what is it? What does it look like? Why is this problematic? In her 2020 article, Jackson does an exceptional job of breaking down the term digital blackface to describe various types of menstrual performance that become available in cyberspace. Pretty straightforward, gross, but straightforward. If you're unfamiliar with the term, blackface is a racist practice of non-black people using makeup, costuming, and over-the-top performance to portray black caricatures. It relies on, on racist sensibilities and dates back to the 19th century. Uh, the BBC put out an excellent explainer video, so I'm going to run that because they explain it way better than I ever could. Ever shared this? Or this? Nothing like a good reaction gif, right? But you've probably noticed the most popular ones of black people being dramatic. This is digital blackface. Blackface is when a non-black person uses makeup to blacken up. Minstrel shows depicted black people in all sorts of negative ways. They were mocking, demeaning stereotypes, and they exaggerated black people's facial features and their expressions. And digital blackface is the 21st century version of that. White people using GIFs to perform some kind of exaggerated blackness. And that's not all. Let's talk about white people using dark-skinned emojis. Hmm. This is a form of cultural appropriation, paying little respect to someone else's culture and using it however you please. So what's wrong with white people posting these GIFs and using these emojis? Well, black people are not here for other people's entertainment. We're not symbols of excessive emotion. And we aren't here to make you look more sassy, more sexy, or more street. We don't want to be seen as having two-dimensional personalities. Let us decide for ourselves how we wish to be perceived. Now, I'm not saying you have to be black to post these GIFs. But what I am saying is think about what you're doing. Ask yourself why you're always drawn to that GIF or that emoji. So that's my view, but what do you think? As Jackson puts it, no digital behavior exists in a de-racialized vacuum. 
We all need to be cognizant of what we share, how we share, and to what extent that sharing dramatizes pre-existing racial formulas inherited from real life. Representation is important. Images and how we communicate shape, shape perception, which in turn shapes behavior. If we're to work on making the world a better place, then we need to be aware of what our communication encapsulates and what it perpetuates. The pervasive use of digital blackface, technology like memes normalizing blackface and intense repetitive imagery and messaging to consumers like those in advertising and propaganda, this system perpetuates the idea that black people act that way because black people act that way, which is stupid, further equating blackness to a thingness that can be categorized and reproduced into a mass cultural commodity instead of being complex and diverse human people. Just like how we understand that our words need to be considered within their historical usage in mind, or with their historical usage in mind, memes also need to be used with intentionality. Both me media consumers and producers must therefore be cognizant of how digital blackface preserves legacies of racism and must recognize the impact they have in changing the racial formations and attitudes developed in American society and I would suggest North American society as well. So what does it look like? Digital blackface looks like a white woman like Meghan McCain using a gif of a black woman to call out people fat shaming former US press secretary, Sean Spicer. Um, it looks like a non-black person, particularly those in positions of economic power or influence using sweet brown meme to appear funny or in touch or modern, um, what really helped me identify when someone is engaging in digital blackface was Anisha Phillips' piece in Feminuity, where she discusses the problematic use of black vernacular English, or BVE, by non-black people, particularly when it comes to the use of reaction gifts and memes. Phillips highlights that author Malboro has four questions she suggests non-black people ask themselves before using words that have their origin in BVE. So one, is it being commercialized for financial gain? Two, is the usage performative or tokenizing? Three, are you in proximity to the culture that originated the terms? And four, are you using the language to level up or earn yourself credibility? If any of those answers are yes, then you are engaging in digital blackface. Megan McCain's use was an example of her engaging digital blackface as performative. The Bob Rivers show used the Sweet Brown meme and sound clip and commercialized them for financial gain. They were engaging in digital blackface. In conclusion, Memes may seem silly, and they certainly can be. I'm not saying memes are inherently racist or culturally appropriative, hashtag not all memes, as I roll my freaking eyes, just that they can be used in those ways. And if you're not a member of the community you're tapping to represent your message, then you need to examine what you're using more critically and its context. We can still engage with memes we enjoy. We just need to be aware of how we, as digital contributors and participants to the internet culture, affect the conversations around things like race and racism. If you learn more about a word and its historical context, and you find out that that word you've been using creates harm for a racial or cultural group you don't belong to, you stop. You find different ways to express yourself. The same can apply to the visual language of memes. The flexible nature of the meme take, makes it an amazing vehicle to convey meaning, build rapport, and tell jokes across boundaries. We can still tap into the idea of a meme without generating harm.